gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, buenos dias, buenas tardes. A very warm welcome to the launch of the new IEA report, Hydrogen in Latin America, from short-term opportunities to large-scale deployment. My name is Rebecca Gagan, head of the IEA division for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. At the IEA, we are convinced that the time is right to tap into hydrogen's potential to play a key role in a clean, secure, and affordable energy future. We have stepped up our work on hydrogen since the 2019 G20 meeting, where the Japanese presidency asked us to prepare a report entitled The Future of Hydrogen. This report has become an annual publication, the Global Hydrogen Review. In addition to monitoring global developments in the sector, we have also began looking at different regions, starting with a first report on Northwest Europe earlier this year. Today, we turn to Latin America. The idea for this report stems from last year's IEA OLADE, Latin American Ministerial Roundtable, where there was a clear sense in the room that hydrogen is moving to the top of the agenda for many governments in the region. At this year's roundtable in July, we presented preliminary results from this report to a number of Latin American ministers. It became very clear again that hydrogen remains a priority. Many governments are working on strategies, roadmaps, and initial pri pilot projects. Indeed, thanks to rich and diverse resource endowments, Latin American countries are very well placed to establish, establish hydrogen economies with multiple benefits for the energy sector and well beyond. But the hydrogen value chain is complex and in many sectors, it is still in early technology development stages. So where exactly should governments focus today? And how can we ensure that the manifold promises of hydrogen, including cleaner energy mixes, economic development, and job creation turn into reality? These are key questions that are currently still being evaluated in studies and road mapping efforts that are underway in ministries and governments across Latin America and globally as well. The IEA would like to support these efforts with the analysis and policy recommendations we are presenting today, but also by continuing to share insights on developments and emerging best practices on hydrogen globally. Thanks to the IEA Hydrogen Technology Collaboration Program, as well as our role as the Chief Operating Agent for the Hydrogen Initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial, we are at the heart of global networks on this issue, and we are delighted to continue to facilitate Latin America's participation in these various initiatives. For this launch event today, we will start with a presentation of the key analysis and recommendations of the report. We are honored that Panama's Secretary of Energy, Dr. Jorge Rivera, will join the following panel discussion, which will also feature representatives from Brazil, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Chilean Hydrogen Association. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the excellent input we received from focal points in ministries in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Trinidad and Tobago, Panama, Paraguay, Uruguay, as well as international experts who have joined an advisory board for the preparation of the report. We also would like to thank the donor countries that made this work possible, especially the United Kingdom, which provided the funding for our initial, our initial research. With that, let me introduce the IA project team. Mariano Berkenwald, who I think many of you know, is our Clean Energy Transitions Program Officer for Latin America, and he has been very dynamically leading this study. Javier Joaquera, our intern from Chile, has provided basically tireless input and support for Mariano from the, from the outset of this project. We have also benefited greatly from the constant guidance and input expertise from IA Hydrogen Technology Analyst, Jose Miguel Bermudez, as well as our Latin America Program Manager, Jorg Hussar, who will moderate the panel discussion that follows. And now without further ado, 
let me invite Mariano Berkenwald to present the key findings and recommendations of this report. Again, hydrogen in Latin America from short-term opportunities to large-scale deployment. Mariano, over to you and thank you all. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and I'm extremely happy to be here with you today to share the main findings of our analysis on this very, very interesting topic. I will try my best to be brief, uh, but there is a lot to say. So I invite everyone who is watching to go to the IEA website after this presentation and download the report, which is now available. The full version of the report in English is now available for download, as well as the executive summaries in Spanish and in Brazilian Portuguese. Let's now move on to the, to the presentation for today. Latin America's clean energy transitions have been gaining traction uh, in, use in recent years. And this is reflected in the increasing, um, increasingly ambitious targets that are being announced by many Latin American countries. In the last couple of months, many countries have presented updated nationally determined contributions to reduce emissions, as well as long-term net zero emission or carbon neutrality objectives for 2050. Um, at this point in time, several of the, of the region's largest countries are discussing um, formalizing these net zero objectives and the actions that will need to happen in order to reach these ambitions. In this context, hydrogen has been gaining increasing amounts of attention in the last couple of years. In November 2020, Chile became the first country to publish a comprehensive national strategy for hydrogen, establishing a long-term vision of the role of low carbon hydrogen in the country's energy systems, as well as a place of Chile in the global energy landscape. Many countries, at least 10 in the region, are currently developing their own national hydrogen strategies, roadmaps, and action plans. Among these, I would like to mention two that happened recently in the last couple of days. Brazil present, the Brazilian government presented the directives for their national energy plans uh, last week. And Colum the Colombian government sent its um, low carbon hydrogen roadmap for public consultation at the moment. This political momentum has been joined by several project announcements, and there is now a healthy project pipeline for low carbon energy, uh, hydrogen projects across Latin America. We counted at least 20 of them. And these include a couple of large scale uh, gigawatt scales projects to produce low carbon hydrogen from water and renewable electricity through electrolysis. Something that is, that is noteworthy about these large projects is that they mostly aim to produce hydrogen and to sell it to export markets. But focusing exclusively on hydrogen exports would have been missing out on the very reasons why hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen is at the top of the global energy agenda. It is important that hydrogen also benefits the region by helping it deliver some of the same benefits that make it so attractive for certain parts of the world that could in the future be importing hydrogen. Looking at Latin America at the regional level in general, we could build a basic case for hydrogen around three axes. The first one is that hydrogen can help reduce emissions in Latin America beyond direct electrifications in the so-called sectors that are with emissions that are hard to abate. Certain industry applications such as steel making, high, temper high temperature heat requirements in some industries like cement, um, some applications in long distance transport, including aviation, shipping, and road transport. The second point is that high, low carbon hydrogen can also further integrate renewables and therefore increase security of supply. For example, hydrogen can provide seasonal and long-term energy storage with low carbon, something that is bound to become increasingly important in a region where hydropower um, is a mainstay of the electricity systems and is exposed to increasing levels of variability um, in, between years. 
A third point, which we feel is very important for Latin America as a whole, is that hydrogen could be an opportunity for the region to create jobs and economic opportunities for its citizens. Some of these opportunities may arise from the establishment of technological value chains to support a scaling up of low carbon hydrogen in the region, while others may be derived from export revenues from exporting low carbon hydrogen and derived products to other parts of the world. But the region is very diverse. Um, the, the challenges and opportunities that a large industrialized country has are not exactly similar to those of a small Caribbean nation. I wanted to give you some sense of the variety of opportunities that could come with low carbon hydrogen for the different countries in the region. And I, of course, invite you to check the report for more information on these cases and for additional examples. A couple of them seemed worth mentioning. The first one has to do with bioenergy, which is a key ingredient in Latin America's energy mix. And one of the reasons why Latin America is considered to be at the forefront um, of using renewable energy. In countries where bioenergy is used extensively, such as Brazil, but also Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay, these industries may hold competitive sources of biogenic carbon, which in addition to competitive low carbon hydrogen could be combined to produce thin synthetic fuels in the future. Hydrogen is also required to manufacture some advanced biofuels, such as hydro-treated vegetable oils, so there's an additional linkage there. Chile is currently the world's largest copper producer, and Peru is actually the second largest. Um, copper, as we know, is going to be a crucial element for our clean energy transitions, and I invite you to read the recent IEA work on critical minerals in energy transitions, but copper demand would continue to increase in line with our clean energy needs. In Chile, um, the mining industry, which is mostly copper mining in large open, pits, in open pit mines, is responsible for a quarter of the national diesel consumption. And hydrogen could be one of the technologies that could allow the sector to reduce emissions uh, and also reduce the import of diesel uh, into the country. And indeed, um, some large Chilean companies in the private sector have ambitious targets to reduce emissions as soon as 2030. So there we could have an interesting opportunity to develop technologies and deploy hydrogen-based solutions. Costa Rica, Paraguay, and Uruguay in many ways are a step ahead uh, when it comes to the clean energy transitions. They have almost fully decarbonized their power generation mixes and are looking at the next steps of their clean energy transitions, um, which would have to focus on transport, which, re which represents a very large share of emissions in all of these three countries. Hydrogen, especially fuel cell electric vehicles, alongside other sustainable mobility technologies, namely battery electric vehicles, could be one of the ingredients needed to decarbonize the transport sector in these countries. Panama is in a strategic location at the crossroad of many major international shipping routes. And its strategic location and relevance in international shipping could help the country become a regional hub for low carbon hydrogen distribution and trade. And last, but certainly not least, Trinidad and Tobago is already a major hydrogen producer globally and one of the largest exporters of methanol and ammonia. This country could leverage the existing industrial facilities to develop low carbon hydrogen resources uh, and access emerging opportunities for international tra trade. So, as a bottom line, we would say that the versatility that hydrogen has as an energy carrier enables each country to tailor its strategy to the opportunities, context, and strategic priorities that are, that are most suited. This versatility can also be a double-edged sword because it also means that developing hydrogen intersects with many other programs looking to reduce emissions using other technologies or taking a sectoral approach. So the coordination of actions aimed at hydrogen with other clean energy initiatives is something that is very important to keep in mind. I'm very proud to show you this slide because as far as we know, this, uh, the report we are publishing today contains one of the first comprehensive analysis 
of the current baseline for hydrogen in Latin America, that is quantifying the demand and, and supply of hydrogen today. We took 2019 as a base year, and our analysis shows that there, were more, there, were, there was a demand uh, north of four megatons of hydrogen in Latin America. This demand uh, is divided between four major applications. Uh, the first three applications represent around 30% of demand at a regional level. Um, these applications are ammonia production, oil refining, and methanol production. And the last one is a direct reduction of iron, a process used in steel making, which accounts for around 10% of total regional demand for hydrogen. In oil refining, hydrogen is used to upgrade heav heavy crudes and also to remove sulfur from refined products. In ammonia production, um, hydrogen, hydrogen is used, uh, well, to produce ammonia, of course, which is then in turn used to manufacture fertilizers and explosives that are used in the mining industry. I have to add that 2019 was a specific year, uh, a particular year for ammonia production around Latin America, as many large plants in Brazil and Mexico were idle during this year. Some of the production from these facilities has since restarted. So the numbers you see for 2019 in ammonia are usually higher on a regular year, or at least there is installed capacity that is higher to produce more. Um, six countries in Latin America, Trinidad and Tobago, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico account for almost 80% of the region's um, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen demand. Trinidad and Tobago alone accounts for more than 40% of the region's total. So it's pretty, very much a, a heavyweight in Latin America when it comes to hydrogen demand and supply. Almost all of the hydrogen that was produced in Latin America to meet this demand was produced through carbon intensive technological routes, mostly from natural gas. A part of these, the emissions resulting from hydrogen product, production from natural gas are temporarily sequestered in the form of urea, which is manufactured in the region using a part of the emissions, which are later released when urea is applied to pastures and used as a fertilizer. Low carbon production routes are very, very small uh, in 2019, and production of, um, of hydrogen using electricity represented much, much less than 1% in 2019 and limited to three pilot projects, one in Argentina, one in Chile, and one in Costa Rica, as well as some electrolyzers uh, that, are, that run on grid electricity and not exclusively renewable electricity and therefore cannot be considered to be low carbon hydrogen production. As an anecdote, um, one of the largest electrolyzers in the world currently in operation is located close to the city of Cusco in Peru, where it is used to produce ammonia and then ammonium nitrate used in agriculture and in mining. Uh, I should also add uh, at this point that hydrogen production in Latin America is already a major source of emissions. Um, for all the hydrogen that was produced, um, the emissions were actually larger than all the road vehicles in Colombia, and producing this required more natural gas than all of the country of Chile in 2019. So emissions from hydrogen production are a problem today and now in Latin America. We think that the next decade would be crucial for the future of hydrogen in Latin America, and that there is a lot that the countries around the region uh, can do to, to make sure that this bright future comes to reality. Um, maybe a good way to start uh, to talk about the complexity of the problem is, is to visualize and compare uh, against some of the recent developments in the region. In recent years, Latin America has successfully managed uh, to deploy, uh, to, to deploy large, uh, a large capacity of wind and solar power. And this is, uh, this is something that is fresh in the memories of many policymakers and analysts in the region. Um, so in this case, in the case of variable renewable electricity, it depended mostly on mature technologies, but also leveraging the existing demand for the product they, they produced, which is electricity, and the infrastructure that was already available, the grid to transport it and uh, link demand with supply, 
and the existing market and market mechanisms that allowed some of the projects to become to to be financed at the end of the day. The situation for hydrogen could be more challenging because in the case of hydrogen, when it comes to new uses of hydrogen, you have to make sure that the supply and the demand and the mechanisms to physically link them, as well as the infrastructure, come online in a coordinated way. This is a, a very complex task, but we think that it can be done. So as I mentioned, in contrast with some variable renewable technologies, low carbon hydrogen production uses and transport depend on many technologies that are not technologically mature yet or not commercially available. And when they are, they are available at a very, very high premium. So the technological race to develop the hydrogen solutions of tomorrow is one of the most exciting challenges looking ahead into the next decade. And we feel that Latin America can join these efforts um, and contribute to help make low carbon hydrogen a bigger part of our energy systems. And it can find a lot of opportunities along the way um, in, by supporting R&D and pilot and demonstration projects, developing technologies that are adapted to its own context um, and helping unlock benefits beyond just reducing emissions, but also creating technological value chains and opportunities um, and also opportunities for people. And in that sense, it is very, we feel that an early focus on innovation, but also on skills development is, uh, is a good bet for Latin America at this point in time. Uh, I should also mention that sometimes when we say these things that Latin America has the potential to join uh, the innovation push, uh, we tend to forget that Latin America has done that successfully in the past. We can take the example of Brazil and biofuels and how Brazil now has the largest fleet of flex fuel vehicles that can run both on gasoline and on mixes uh, of, uh, of bioethanol. Uh, this was technology that was developed in Brazil through a lot of effort and sustained policies uh, to support this. And it has, it has been a success. In the same way, Argentina has now deployed more than 2,000 uh, compressed natural gas refueling stations across the country, showing that, um, that there is a possibility of introducing these kinds of new uh, technologies in the country's uh, energy systems. The next decade, we think, in addition to this technological development, will also be crucial to prepare the ground for a later scaling up uh, of low carbon hydrogen technologies, which could happen in the longer term. And this could also leverage existing demand, and we mentioned a couple of, of cases, as well as existing industrial value chains. Um, to do this, the region will have to start thinking seriously about removing the regulatory barriers, deploying the enabling infrastructure, for instance, hydrogen refueling uh, stations to support hydrogen mobility, um, developing as early as possible the safety standards that would be needed, which are a pre-requirement for any new use of hydrogen, but also establishing the low carbon certification and guarantee of origin schemes that will be so important to make low carbon hydrogen an attractive product for both domestic and international consumers. And it is in that sense that we feel that it's important that um, that, is, that the, import, the importance of low carbon certification and guarantees of origin should be one of the initial steps. It's a long process to develop and establish these kinds of mechanisms. And it's important that they are compatible and recognized with future trading partners to allow the region to access uh, emerging trade opportunity in low carbon goods. We spent some time during this report studying how demand for hydrogen could evolve in Latin America in the next 10 years. Um, ju just to mention a couple of highlights and you'll be able to find more detailed analysis on each of the end use we analyzed. Um, we developed two cases to study this. One is more of a baseline case and the second is an accelerated case. Uh, which essentially is an optimistic vision for the, the, the technological development and the uptake of new technology. Uh, it also assumes that the region will enact more ambitious policy targets and support measures to bring that closer to reality. And that infrastructure that enables these users will come online at the time it's needed. 
But even in this very ambitious scenario, what we can see overall is that new uses of hydrogen will represent only a small fraction of the region's total hydrogen demand by 2030. Actually, less than 20% of the total uh, hydrogen demand will come from these new applications of hydrogen. And that reinforces the message of the importance of talking about current hydrogen production and later on decarbonizing it by switching to low carbon technological routes. A couple of, word, of additional words about the new uses. The report analyzes uses in industry, in transport, in mining, in the power sector, and in buildings. Not all of these uses have been quantified for a diversity um, of, region, uh, of reasons, but what I could mention is that the industry sector is the one that could mobilize the largest volumes uh, of hydrogen, even in this initial deployment stage. Specifically, in the iron and steel uh, sector, using low carbon hydrogen in blast furnaces could be an opportunity um, for, for the region to decarbonize steel make, to reduce emissions from steel making, and to create some demand uh, for low carbon hydrogen along the way. Mobility um, and fuel cell electric vehicles and hydrogen fueled shipping has been gaining a lot of attention. We analyze this and we come to the conclusion that even in this very ambitious scenario, the deployment, especially of road mobility would be very limited. Um, by 2030, we could see around 14,000 fuel cell electric vehicles in the region that would be supported by more than 1,500 hydrogen refueling stations. So even for this very limited rollout initially, um, we would need important investments in supporting infrastructure, which highlights a part of the challenge uh, that lies ahead for these solutions. Um, so but as a conclusion from this slide, I would highlight again the importance of the current uses of hydrogen, uses in refining in the chemical industry and in the iron and steel sector, which will remain very relevant uh, in the next 10 years. And now let's talk about the supply side for a little bit. Um, we, what we think is that the challenge lying ahead on the supply side is to progressively decarbonize the existing hydrogen production routes, which, as we mentioned, are very carbon intensive, and at the same time guarantee that new demand for hydrogen is met with low carbon hydrogen only. We see great opportunities across the region to develop many kinds of low carbon hydrogen. Um, and one of these opportunities is to capture the CO2 emissions from existing fossil fuel based production of hydrogen. Um, this could allow reaching a relatively large scale um, pretty quickly and big emissions reductions in the medium term. But of course, this depends on the availability and the suitability of carbon capture and storage facilities, locations and infrastructure. Uh, when we analyze the competitiveness from now to 2030, something that is seen very clearly is the importance of pricing carbon. And the graphic you see on the screen for 2030 assumes that there will be a carbon price that is similar to the levels we are now seeing in the European uh, emissions trading scheme, a price of around 50 to 60, I think, um, dollars per tons of CO2. Um, what we see, uh, what we can clearly see in this graph as well, is that the biggest cost reductions between now and 2030 are to be seen in electrolytic hydrogen produced from renewable electricity. And the drop there of the yellow and green boxes is pretty spectacular to 2030. By 2030, producing hydrogen from solar power could be already be competitive against fossil-based alternatives in the best locations. And this graph doesn't consider other sources of low carbon hydro, uh, of low carbon electricity that could power the electrolyzers. The region is notable for its hydropower, but also there would be possibilities of using offshore wind resources that are starting to get attention. Even nuclear power could be used to produce uh, low carbon hydrogen. And in the longer term, this is even more true. Prices fall dramatically to 2030, but even more so going to the long term. By 2050, we think that there could be 
locations where hydrogen production prices would be below a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen, extremely competitive prices. And you see in the map here, the different areas that, have the, that could have the highest potential to produce competitive hydrogen. And of course, immediately you notice the Atacama Desert, which is, uh, which is an area that extends over four countries, but you can also find excellent opportunities in Northeastern Brazil, Northern Mexico, Northern Colombia, even Uruguay, and the Patagonia in Argentina and Chile. Uh, so there is, there is a lot there. Uh, there is a lot of potential to produce competitive uh, hydrogen across the region. And it's not only that it's competitive, it's also that it's abundant. We did a spatial analysis uh, on this, and we come to the conclusion that there could be more than 800,000 kilometers where uh, hydrogen production costs could be below $1 per, per kilogram by 2050. This is larger than the size of France and the United Kingdom combined. If you go to the next cost bracket, you're already talking about half the size of the European Union in areas. Of course, not all of this area is able to be built, but this can, calculation uh, considers some exclusion zones such as difficult geographies, urban centers, waterways, protected areas, uh, et cetera. But so we feel that Latin America could become a competitive and abundant supplier of hydrogen, but it is by no means the only one. Several regions of the world are, have similar characteristics to Latin America and may be in a better position to capture international trading, uh, trade opportunities. Regions like Australia or like the Middle East and North Africa even Eurasia, are also looking into similar opportunities. So it's really important that the region acts now if it wants to secure its position in the global hydrogen landscape going forward. The report, after analyzing a couple of key areas for policy development, including innovation, financing, um, and certification mechanism, the report provides a series of six recommendations for policymakers in, La in Latin America to make hydrogen uh, closer to reality. You can explore in more detail each of these recommendations in the report. The six recommendations are, number one, and we feel like it should always be number one, it is important to define a long-term vision for hydrogen and the energy systems and doing uh, launching and publishing strategies that are consensual and built with agreement between stakeholders and strong in, uh, engagement is an excellent way of doing that. The second one is to identify near-term opportunities and support the initial deployment of key technologies. These technologies uh, at the, during the initial phases of deployment will come at a price premium and it is important to bridge uh, that competitive gap through support me measures. Third one, supporting these early financing schemes and reducing investment risks going forward. The fourth one is to focus on R&D or betting on innovation and skills to reap benefits beyond just emissions reductions. Uh, the fifth one is to use certification schemes to, to foster low carbon hydrogen production and demand and to create market opportunities. And the last one, but definitely not least, is to cooperate regionally and internationally to position Latin America in the global hydrogen landscape. A couple of final thoughts about this last point, which as to know is very close to our heart in, a, in the International Energy Agency. I have to begin by saying that Latin America's energy systems are interconnected rather than integrated. And this is a missed opportunity for Latin America, which could benefit enormously in the context of, his, of its own energy transitions by integrating better <clears throat> to allow for a better utilization of, of, uh, of its renewable and non-renewable resources. Some concrete examples of uh, ways we feel in which the region could collaborate to accelerate development pooling limited resources for research development and deployment to co-develop solutions that may be specific to Latin America, including high altitude mining uh, in Peru and Chile, or linkages between hydrogen and bioenergy in Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. It is also important that countries ensure the compatibility of the technologies they use uh, and coordinate the rollout of sustainable uh, technologies across borders. This is particularly essential when it comes to transport, both shipping, aviation, and also road transport. 
If the infrastructures and the, the operating requirements are not compatible, then uh, the sustainable mobility technologies will not be able to be used across borders. And as we know, regional trade in Latin America depends mostly on trucks and on shipping, which often have to go through thousands and thousands of kilometers. This is something the region will need to do together in a coordinated way. And this is, of course, not just about hydrogen. It's also about other sustainable technologies like battery electric vehicles. Moreover, um, it, the countries in the region should try to identify and exploit the complementarities and synergies in the profiles of different countries of the region. And this will allow to build economies of scale to then install regional supply chains across the sector, supplying the whole of Latin America or several countries as opposed to one uh, country individually. And finally, international collaboration can help secure the region's position in the global hydrogen landscape by staying abreast of the latest technological and policy developments and also the best practices that are starting to appear by contributing to the shaping of global hydrogen markets and by establishing the links with potential future trading partners, harmonizing certification schemes to, be, to ensure access to these emerging trade opportunities. And before I end my presentation, and as mentioned by Rebecca, I would like to let you know that in early October, we will be publishing our Global Hydrogen Review at Japan's Hydrogen Ministerial. A couple of days later, we will also be launching a report on the role of low carbon fuels in clean energy transitions of the power sector. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I look forward to hearing what our authorities and regional experts have to say. With that, I, I would like to introduce Jörg Huzar, Latin America Program Manager at the IEA, who will be moderating this panel discussion. Thank you very much, and over to you, Jörg. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mariano, for this excellent presentation, and kudos again to you and Javier Cortera for the excellent work on the report. Uh, so now we turn on the round of comments from uh, distinguished policymakers and practitioners from Latin America. And let me invite all the panelists to now switch on their camera so that we can uh, have a conversation. And we are honored to welcome Panama Secretary of Energy for this discussion. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Secretary Rivera, you were among the ministers at last year's IEA OLADE Ministerial Roundtable who actually encouraged us to look more closely into the topic in the region and Today, here we are launching the report, and it's really great to have you on board uh, for the discussion. Uh, we are also delighted to welcome Agnes Costa, head of the Advisory on Regulatory Affairs at the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy. Mrs. Uh, Michelle Alak, a Senior Energy Specialist at the Inter-American uh, Inter Development Bank, and Hans Kuhlenkampf, President of H2 Chile on this panel to provide their perspectives on the report and uh, some updates uh, on their respective hydrogen efforts. So we've scheduled about 30 minutes for this discussion. Uh, it would be great if everybody could stick more or less to their five minute uh, time allotment. Now, without further ado, let me invite Secretary Vera to make your comments. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Jorg, and greetings to Mariano and the team to, at the International Energy Agency. Uh, for us, it's uh, um, a great day because uh, we are looking uh, at a milestone uh, on this process of developing uh, a world um, green hydrogen uh, market. Uh, I can recall exactly the day that we were talking about in that round table um, and uh, with the IDB and the agency and OLADE. And we closed our remarks with this recommendation or proposal about, you know, this uh, regional uh, focus and approach on the development of, of hydrogen. And we are really happy to see that this is one of the key recommendations, um, as Mariano has said, and, the, and this is in the report. Because for this, uh, we were talking about two main um, uh, issues that uh, are already are, are also in the report as key recommendation. One is about the R&D uh, approach that the, the resources and the lack of uh, some opportunities to re research and development in our region, we need that regional approach on that. And of course, the, one of the other main uh, challenging uh, recommendation for our, our region is uh, about financing and investing 
uh, when we compared our region with the other um, regions of the world. So uh, I would think that it's a, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a, a key milestone for our uh, de deployment of uh, policies and uh, pilot projects and innovation in our uh, countries. That is why um, you have mentioned uh, all these uh, um, developments in, in our countries are going ahead. We are developing right now, most of the, of the countries, um, our roadmaps for that. And Panama is not an exception. We're working hard on that uh, as uh, uh, the key uh, recommendation, the number two that uh, is in the report about identifying this new term opportunities. That is, that is what we are doing right now. We think that uh, Latin America, uh, Caribbean countries want to, to play an important role in the energy transition, um, in the production and export of green hydrogen in large scale. Uh, at the same time, uh, we developed our own H2 sector and decarbonize our industry and transport. And we keep increasing our renewable, already renewable energy matrix on the power sector. The, national, the international demand for green hydrogen uh, will be mainly in Asia and Europe because in those regions, additional support is needed for the carbonation of their economy. Um, but uh, large scale production plants shall start operation from 2025. We can go ahead and become, as the report in the last slides uh, we saw from Mariano, as uh, this big opportunity with the resources we have to win hydrogen. Our conditions in Latin America are, uh, make it unbeatable to benefit from this development of this global uh, market. But uh, to take advantage of this capacity, our public policies that promote this energy transition require, require cohesion, a fusion with access to financing, both public and private, that maximizes economic development by bearing on the construction of energy infrastructure um, that is not only renewable, but also resilient to climate uh, challenges. Um, to this joint collaboration in Latin America, uh, with position clearly as a robust green hydrogen market, highlighting our talents, ideas, and resources available at the service of love and pushing us closer to this goal uh, that we have of 1.5 degrees globally. Um, Panama in particular, now we have the opportunity to contribute, not only uh, become this green hydrogen route associated to the Panama Canal that we're working hard with this authority for the excellency in our excellency in logistics but also can help uh, to decarbonize the maritime sector while becoming uh, a green hydrogen transformation port according to the these uh, some reports as the hydrogen europe study called how hydrogen can help decarbonize the maritime sector maritime ports will have a key role in this transition towards the hydrogen economy ports will become this uh, hydrogen hubs or hydrogen valleys where hydrogen can be produced, imported, stored, and distributed for use in different applications. Uh, our green hydrogen transformation hub will have the objective to facilitate the import or export of A2 by making it cheaper and to facilitate the transport in short or medium term. Our Latin American Caribbean countries could transport green hydrogen in a comprehensive form until a transformational hub near the Panama Canal, which will be less expensive and use already available technologies. At the Panama Canal area, centralized large-scale plants could be installed to transform this green hydrogen different carriers like ammonia, liquid H2, acrocene, imethanol, or even till uh, the, the transformation in, in steel, you know, in order to transport more quantities of this green hydrogen in this carrier for long distance to Europe and Asia. We want to facilitate export trade from Latin America and Caribbean to where the main current demand of hydrogen is, uh, while prioritizing our circular economy and while ensuring CO2 abatement without leaks. We want to uh, finalize our phase one uh, of our green hydrogen backbone roadmap in December this year. Uh, we're working this uh, hard with the support of the IDB actually, and uh, in September we'll be hosting uh, two workshops with Latin American Caribbean government representatives uh, on the technical level and on the decision makers level to explore this collaboration opportunities to strengthen our green hydrogen that bond us. Um, we are going to launch this dialogue process 
to carry out, of course, these changes, policy and regulatory that we need to enhance in our country, how to update and upgrade our regulatory um, framework to have the potential. Finally, just to, to mention that uh, according to this uh, key recommendation, the number one, we want uh, we, this hydrogen roadmap that we are developing, this vision is part of our um, energy transition agenda, this holistic and integral um, uh, roadmap for the next 10 years and then to the year 2030. And hydrogen is a key part of this, uh, in this decarbonization, digitalization, and democratization of our energy sectors. And we are sure that we can uh, keep uh, sharing our uh, development ideas and expertise to, to go further on, on that issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And uh, indeed, Panama's vision of uh, its role in the hydrogen sector is really highlighting the, uh, the opportunities that hydrogen is creating beyond the mere production uh, of hydrogen, you know, focusing on logistics and value chains that could cross, cut across the region as also highlighted in the report. And uh, so this is actually a very uh, interesting point, I think, for our discussion here today. So with that, uh, we'll now move on to Mrs. Agnes da Costa from the Ministry of Mines and Energy of Brazil, uh, which last week actually presented guidelines for the development of a hydrogen program in Brazil. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Agnes. Over to you. Thank you, York. Thank you, Mariana. Your presentation was very great. We were anxious to take a look into the report. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and be among these distinguished panelists discussing such an interesting topic for the region and for the world. And you were mentioning something that I was thinking about. We are used uh, uh, with working with sector reforms, power sector reforms, gas market reform, but now we are discussing the creation of a market, the creation of an industry. And we have to be able to look into the opportunities that are available to tackle the challenges, but to do this in a very comprehensive way, as you mentioned, in a systematized way so that we don't waste opportunities. So, and also we have to think that we have this clock ticking about decarbonization by 2050. So, uh, so I, th I think, and I'm very pleased to see that we are all working together at the same time in the same agenda. So we were contributing to your report, designing our directives. And now we are here to mention a bit what we have done in the last 60 days. So just to mention, we have in Brazil, a board of ministers, they delegated to the Ministry of Mines and Energy in cooperation with the Ministry of Science and Technology, Technology and Innovation and with the Ministry of Regional Development with the support of our Energy Research Office to come up with directives for a national program for hydrogen in Brazil. And that, this is what we have been doing in the last 60 days. We just presented this last week and we came with about 52 directives more or, more or less. And I was very pleased to see that your key recommendations, they are really well aligned with our, with our directives. So just to, to, to explain it to you, what we have done, we have started thinking that we have to uh, think in the about the development of the industry and of the market in Brazil for hydrogen, uh, for its energy, energetic use, because we have already hydrogen being used for indust industrial purposes. Uh, and so we are talking about designing a market and designing an industry that is being born into a global value chain that is being born at the same time everywhere. So uh, how do we do this? And then we, we thought that we have to, we've decided to build a policy or the program uh, uh, based on three pillars. So public policies, technology, and market. And then I always mention your um, a net, a net zero scenario by 2050 from the IEA, where we see that for, for this net zero scenario by 2050, we have to think about new technological developments uh, a lot. So this is very important. So then uh, thinking of about uh, in, uh, in, in these three pillars, we see that they are interdependent and they have to evolve synchronously so that they can accelerate cost reduction and scale up hydrogen production and use across sectors. 
uh, creating stronger conditions for deeper decarbonization of energy. So this is these are the three pillars. And then we, we divided our directives in three in six axes. So uh, the first one, strengthening the scientific and technological basis. Second, training and capacity building. Third, energy planning. Fourth, legal and regulatory normative framework. And here we talk a lot about sector coupling. So this is the part we discussed it a lot with industries in several re uh, re uh, meetings. And we see this is where our uh, people who want to invest in it are more anxious about. They have to see, uh, to understand which uh, regulation, which legal framework applies to what because we are discussing hydrogen, this is like a, a, an energy vector that may be produced from several uh, 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 energy sources and has several uses. So how do we set a regulatory framework or which regulatory framework do we use for this? And then the fifth uh, axis is market opening, uh, growth and competitiveness. And six is international corporate Co cooperation. So when I think about uh, your uh, six, also six uh, recommendations, I see all of our guidelines, they fit into your recommendations and they are really well aligned. I would uh, want to mention some of them. So when you mention, for example, define a long-term vision for hydrogen and energy system, uh, this is for sure what we wanted to address in our energy planning um, part or access. And there we mentioned that not only we have to go after uh, primary data and find information and, my, uh, uh, and, and fill the gaps in information where the potentials are for use and, and supply, uh, but also we, we also saw that we have to incorporate uh, hydrogen in our energy planning. So the last uh, uh, long, long run uh, 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 planning study is, has like 30 years uh, of, of, of uh, uh, horizon. It already looked into hydrogen as a disrupt disruptive technology, but our 10 year plan that will be launched next year, we have also a chapter uh, dedicated to hydrogen. But then in these studies, we have uh, with these discussions with several ministers as well, we have to think also in incorporating not only the impacts in sustainability, but the impacts in water resources and the pressures on power systems. So this is something that Mariano already mentions, but in our case in Brazil, we have an, an enormous interconnected grid. So how will this affect this grid and how do we do the transmission planning, looking into this new kind of demand, specifically when we are talking about uh, green hydrogen uh, as it's been uh, very much discussed in the region. Then uh, another axis that I would like to highlight is, um, when we talk, when you discuss use of certification schemes to foster low carbon hydrogen production and create market opportunities, this is something that we have uh, incorporated in our access of uh, market competitiveness and also in uh, in, in international co collaboration, because we think, as already mentioned, that uh, hydrogen uh, in Brazil or everywhere else will play a role and will be part in a global value chain. So thinking about certification schemes, as we already mentioned, is very important, but looking that this has, uh, that this uh, uh, speaks to other certification schemes elsewhere. Uh, and then another thing that is in very uh, in interesting, uh, then I love Mariano that you highlighted the sixth uh, recommendation of yours, because we talked about international collaboration in general, but you highlight and uh, the part, and this is also the goal of this uh, report, but of the regional uh, collaboration that we have to uh, think about when discussing hydrogen, developing our strategies and policies and our markets and industry in each countries. So I think it was a very good co uh, contribution from you. And also what we then put at the end is uh, three more directives about uh, the governance structure, because we think that this program, it will be a living program, in fact. We know the things that we have to, uh, the good questions we have, but we have to start answering them. So for this, we will uh, 
create a governance structure. And this will be, in fact, the first step to create a technical committee for this program with a participation of several stakeholders. So this committee will manage the program, will meet periodically, and ensure also accountability and monitoring of results. And the idea is that we approve like a, a, a pluriannual uh, working program so that we can work on this and, and, and move forward. So we are really pleased to be here sharing this idea and this, this, um, this moment that we are living together and, and we'll be able to collaborate uh, uh, in future activities. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Agnes, for these comments and insights on, on your process. And indeed, I mean, your six axes of the guidelines really chime very well with the recommendations of the report. And you put, I was emphasize, I have a lot of the regulatory dimension. And uh, indeed, here you have a lot of hen and egg problems where you have to regulate a sector that doesn't exist, but the sector won't emerge if you don't start setting those regulations. So it's, it's really fascinating to see. Some countries have started to put in place regulating roadmaps. So to, to, to signal to market participants which regulations they plan to uh, set uh, at what point in time in the next decade, so to speak, to give really the long-term view, that can be one solution for that, but really looking forward uh, how that was also in Brazil. Thanks so much, Agnes, for that. And so we move on to Michelle for a look on the financial side of things uh, and looking forward to your comments, Michelle, from the Inter-American Development Bank. Over to you. Thank you very much first of all, for the opportunity to be here and to discuss with you and to be able to review the report and congrats to IEA and to Mariano and all the team with the big, the huge effort to put it in the regional level. We know that's, that's, that's hard. It's not an easy task, but it's quite interesting because we are able to look to the heterogeneity, we are able to look the difference and how we need to approach strategically this kind of thing. So, um, when you look from IDB, uh, it's really important to see that we have a, a commitment to support green hydrogen as part of the clean energy solution of 2050. So that's, that's key for us. Why? Why this is key? Because it's aligned with the IDB vision for 2025. The vision of 2025, it's a blueprint for achieving sustainable and inclusive economic and social development in the region in the coming years. And it outlines five areas for our work in the region. It includes regional integration, strengthening the value chain, support small and medium sized business, digitalization, and work towards gender equality and the climate action. And if you look on this vision and how we think it integrates with um, hydrogen economy, it's really clear that climate change is key. And for us, climate change is not just something that uh, we, we, will, we need to do, it's really necessary for being back after this pandemic crisis that was really important in the region. And it's a way to, to be back better and sustainable in the long run. And as I mentioned, the idea, and as I mentioned, and as you discussed, Agnes and also um, uh, Jorge Vieira mentioned before, integration is key when you talk about hydrogen. One point, it's all the discussion about certification and standards. That's really important to look on that um, regionally, but also the development of the, the value chain. That's it's a, a opportunity and something that was quite interesting. The report it was the underline of the part of research, research and development, the value chain and the pilots, the importance of the pilots. When you look to 2030, for afterwards you'll be able to scale up and develop uh, what to expect for the next uh, 30 years, because 2030 is just the first step for what we need to decarbonize in 2050. So that's something really important and. As also was mentioned uh, by, by Mariano, I guess the question of uh, um, capacity, employment, it's key here. It's key for this recovery and also it's key for um, be able to develop this industry in the long run. And for there, we open a, a room, a space, a something that allow us to do something that's really important for IDB, that's policy for gender gender equality. So when you are working in this competition, you are building a new industry, as just Agnes mentioned now, we are have the potential to build it, 
better in some way, build it much more eco. So we are, you see that's a potential to actually uh, have some gender uh, policies when you look on uh, green hydrogen or high, uh, discarbonized um, in the hydrogen industry. So that's something important to us. And when you look on that, it, and the last pillar that's when you talk about digitalization is also something quite interesting because when you think about certification that will be really important in this development because of the CO2 emissions, because the objective of the hydrogen development now it's discarbonization so knowing how much co2 are emitting knowing where the hydrogen where the how hydrogen is produced how the footprint would be key and one of the interesting way to deal with certification it's including new technologies and we start to look about blockchains and how digitalization that can be useful to that so all these elements that seems um in different part of the process, it's really aligned with the vision of the bank. And that's why Green Hydrogen Initiative at IDB is something uh, really important by, for us. And also because, and especially because it's really something that you see the demand in the countries. Right now, you are supporting or in the process to or projects to support 15 countries in the region uh, about um, hydrogen to explore that potential to explore that potential uh, to, to, to position them, themselves strategically in this new um, industry. Not new because they exist, but the, the, the size and the characteristic of these industries is completely changed. So to have this, this uh, position in the region, because as it was uh, shown in this report, on one hand, the region has a huge potential because of the reno renewable resource, but also because we already have some knowledge about hydrogen inside of the region. On the other hand, we have uh, uh, many other regions that have potential and this increase in uh, potential, we need to be able to, um, we need to be able to position ourselves strategically now to, to, to be able to benefit the most of uh, the next years uh, in the growing of this industry. So we congrats and we will be using the IA report in this way because this heterogeneity that shows shows that we need to deal and to support the countries um, in different ways and it's why that our initiative have different um, uh, pillars and different products to support the countries. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Michelle, and uh, thanks for highlighting that the challenge is uh, even more complex than we mentioned uh, so far today with additional um, additional dimensions like gender and digitalization that can also be and have to be part of, of a holistic strategy for the, for the sector going forward. So thanks a lot for your comments, and we move now to uh, the private sector and uh, engagement here, obviously. Um, it becomes uh, crucial very soon when you start developing the sector. And we're looking forward to comments from Hans Kuhlenkampf, president of the Chilean consortium H2 Chile. Over to you, Hans. Thank you, Jörg. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the International Energy Agency for this tremendous report, to Mariano and Javier. I'm a visual learner. So let me uh, put this six measure into a visual representation of what we think we need to do in order to materialize the project. So imagine uh, a pyramid, pyramid of three levels. The first level is run by the people. It's what we need, it's know-how. It's the creation of capacity, it's the creation of brains at every level, policy, journalists, teacher, technicians, engineers. That's the biggest and most important level, it's more easy to be said than to be done. That's where we need to focus. We need more brains. Once the brains appears, it's time for the organization. What organization? The ministries, the, the private sector, and the academia. These three organizations, using the brains that are being created, are going to create different initiatives. Policies are going to create projects and are going to create R&D. This is going to converge in what we want. At the top of the pyramid, we have the project. Are we seeing projects right now? Yes. Are we in the financial investment decision? Not yet. And that's something that we are working in as the Chilean Hydro Association. We are in the middle of this pyramid. We are creating 
what we need, the brain, and we are trying to collaborate with the public sector, with academia, for what? Creating the project. And the key here, in context with also the, IC, the, I, uh, the, the, the ICPP project and the last report that we have, is how do we bring the projects of 2035 towards 2025? And for that, we need some measures. And uh, you saw in the report and you saw in the figures of uh, Mariano that uh, in the columns you have uh, LCOH, you had a five US dollar per kilogram today, between five and six, and it says that in 2030, we're gonna have more or less three. So the key question is to understand how do we move that five towards three right now? And you saw in that line that there is a, um, a column which says off-grid PV or wind. And here I touched some technical things, but I think it's very important to understand why and how, and how could we deal with the economics of bringing those problems, those projects 2030 to 2025. The reason why we are not having financial investment decisions is because we know hydro is a bit more expensive. The reason beneath it is because we are oversizing the electrolyzers, and the electrolyzers are quite expensive right now. So that's a luxury. We cannot oversize electrolyzers today. This means we need to hybridize the way of how we consume electricity. And I touched what Agnes was saying, the power system is very important because many projects are thinking to hybridize wind and PV, while mainly a very important low hanging fruit is to hybridize wind or PV with the grid. So the grid is going to be very important. A good PPA will allow us to decrease the size of the electrolyzer. The problem is, if we connect to the grid, we pay a bit more. And that is something that is a low hanging fruit that we need to work in the dark. How could we create some extensions or some, some in the short term period, some uh, easy way of decreasing the payment of this connection to the grid in order to downsize the electrolyzers and create a cheaper LCOH? That is something that I'm seeing globally as a consultant, and I'm seeing also in the projects in Chile. So as a recommendation to, to the audience, think about how could we use the hydrogen project to make the power system more reliant and construct the new transmission lines that will be required for electrification, the hard to base system, and decrease the size of electrolytes. I'm getting quite technical here, but this is something that the projects are seeing today, I'm, I'm, I'm watching and I'm seeing some projects in Chile fail because of the economics. They will not fail in 2030. They are failing today due to the fact that connecting through the grid will increase the cost today because we don't have a mature electrolyzer um, technology yet. We need to scale up and we need to scale up using the grid. So that's something that is uh, food for thought and it's something that is just there to be used. It may be easier to um, discuss carbon tax, which will also support the tipping point. So I, I give you that, that, uh, that policy measure. How could we use that in order to foster the deployment of heavy, big scale electrolyzers? And my last word, once we understand these technical things, which is the second part of the pyramid and the project starts to occur and we need to collaborate, I touch point on the certification. I think it's incredibly important. We need to work in certification. We need to understand our geography. And I think there are two main differentiators or factors in LATAM. First thing is our geography. We saw it in the, in the report. Second thing, hablamos el mismo idioma, compartimos la misma cultura. It's going to be easy to collaborate among the countries. So that is something very important. The project is going to be most, more or less the same in Mexico and Chile and, and Brazil. But let's use that for our advantage. And I think it's going to be great this decade for hydrogen and Natal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Hans, for this uh, report on very specific uh, challenges and uh, specific uh, policy measure here, that, uh, or a point where we should uh, attack the, the future deployment. So thanks for, for this report. And uh, with that, we are already past uh, the time for this event, unfortunately, but we definitely want to continue this dialogue in uh, many different ways and forms. We're planning another meeting with focal points in governments. And by the way, many thanks again to 
all the government focal points that have participated and given us input and peer review and information that is reflected in the report. Uh, thanks again to the uh, key authors of the report, Mariano Bergenwald and uh, Javier Jorquera with the advice of uh, Jose Bermudez uh, from our technology team and to many other co colleagues across the IA who feel in their expertise on different uh, sectors um, and issues. Um, and uh, so at this point, um, I'd like to uh, also thank again, of course, uh, Secretary Rivera for joining us uh, for this event. Looking forward to working with Panama and, and all the countries that are covered in the report and the region uh, on the topic going forward. And with that, uh, uh, let me conclude the meeting and the launch uh, event and uh, wish you a very nice day. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.